Hello, happy Friday. And this is a little screencast on the universal concurrency modes. By listening to this, you will learn how to leverage pre-built declarative concurrency constructs for the most common concurrency use cases. And this will help you have more concise airtight code. The audience who will get the most out of this are developers doing advanced front-end programming. And by advanced front-end programming, I mean more than just getting the HTML from the server to the client. I mean sophisticated UX, maybe think about games or interrelated async side effects, that type of thing. The benefits will be that you'll have a standard vocabulary to talk about these concurrency modes you'll be able to decouple the concurrency mode from the fulfillment function in your code. I'll show you examples of that. And you'll acquire the ease of switching between concurrency modes that allow you to fine tune the perfect UX over time. The concurrency modes are universal in the sense that everyone has coded at least one of them. I'm not gonna go into deep detail here or explain the diagram at the bottom, but if you're familiar with like buttons, playlists, type aheads, or modal dialogues, then you understand at least on some level that there are different ways you can set up your UX to do async. And that's what this is all about. So to take an example, we're gonna talk about the difference between depth first search and breadth first search. Now, at first, this might not appear to have anything to do with concurrency modes, but in fact, the only difference between these two kinds of searches could be looked at as which concurrency mode they run in. They both enumerate the children of nodes, but differently. So here is the example of a recursive search specifically. There's a content tree, an outline, and it has levels zero and one, and inside of which some levels have sublevels. That's the kind of tree we're talking about, or a forest actually, because zero and one are each trees. And there's two ways to walk this tree. Depth first, where each time you reach a level, you deep dive into it. That's what the order uh, of these points is right now. And so if you traverse in depth first order, you end up with the following traversal order because each time you encounter a node, you must immediately uh, dive into it. Now, breadth first is a little different. Breadth first, uh, you kind of skim each level before going into the deep dive. And so when you, the rule for breadth first is when you discover the children of a node, as you do here, the, no, the children of node one are 1 1.1, 1 1.2, and 1.3, when you discover those children, you throw them forward into the future on a queue usually, and that results in a different traversal order. So what is the minimal difference between something that does the top breadth first and something that does the bottom depth first? And it's queuing. Queuing is the only difference between them. However, if you were to look at the code for each, you'd find them to be very different. These are blurred out because I don't want you to read them. I just want you to feel the shape of the code where the top one, which, does anyone know which one the top one is, depth or breadth? It's depth and it's five lines and one, two, three, four indentation levels. Whereas the bottom one is breadth first and it's over that, it's 12 lines and uh, five indentation level. So typical algorithms for DFS and BFS vary a lot. And my assertion is that it is because they don't separate and decouple the mode from the algorithm. They write the mode into the algorithm. What if you could actually separate them? Well, uh, sorry about the one image missing. It's supposed to show you the difference between bus.listen of exactly the same parameters and bus.listen queuing of exactly the same parameters. If you could switch between listen and listen queuing with just changing that name and you would get a different concurrency behavior, that would be really elegant. It would say something about 
these three functions, node.match, get children, and send through bus, that they are coded in such a way to be decoupled from exactly which concurrency mode you're using. And more maintainable code is the outcome. So to actually show every part of this, we'll show the part that fires or triggers events for the top level nodes. We'll show something that takes uh, the children of a node and turns those into further events for the event bus. And then we'll talk about how to get an observable of children from a given node, which will populate those previous events. We'll actually show in the final listing, these have to be uh, executed in the reverse order, but we'll explain them in this order and just kind of build out dependencies as we need them. So to start off with top level nodes, we have an array of nodes that are at the top level of the tree. We write an action creator function that will take a payload of type node and turn it into a flux standard action with type and payload. And our uh, top level nodes for each of them, we run them through the action creator and trigger them to the bus. Simple enough. Well, now we need to talk about what's on the bus and how the bus manages to do something about those new node events. The bus is declared as an omnibus instance uh, that carries actions, um, flux standard actions with type and payload properties. Uh, we just include the new node action creator function again so you can see it. And then we write a thing called send node through bus, which is a type called an observer that can handle the output of an observable. And all this observer does is anytime that observable produces a next event, we're going to emit nodes, um, then we're just going to trigger an action containing that node in the payload. And then all we need to do is say bus.listen. Um, the first function to node uh, bus.listen is a predicate that says whenever we get an action that is of this type, new node, then get the children of the node as data and for each child, send that node through the bus using that observer. That's how we glue those pieces together. Lastly, how do we get an observable of a node's children? Well, an observable has an operator or a, a function called from that can turn something like an array into a synchronous observable. So when we get the array of children from a node, we simply return from children. So all those pieces together, uh, we have an interface node, children of a type node array, text of type string. We have the bus of actions of type node and the action creator to create those and the observer to re-trigger them. We go to the top level of the tree and get its nodes. We listen for any new node on the bus responding with node.children we dropped the uh, from node.children because it wasn't technically necessary. And then for each of those children, we send that node through the bus. And then we just need to kick it off with top level nodes for each trigger that new node action. This gets it done where if you change from listen to listen queuing, you get the difference in behavior with just a one line diff. So that's the advantage of extracting uh, the concurrency mode from the rest of the code. Takeaways. Start seeing these concurrency modes in things like your remote control for your television. Try and intuit what concurrency mode it's in or your you know button for a uh, vacuum cleaner. Um, check out the Omnibus RxJS library that has this listen, listen queuing, um, type of, of behavior and these other behaviors that you can see in the graphic and on the readme of the library. And that's the address of the library and some documentation I've written for it. And I hope you enjoy it and let me know if you have any questions. Cheers.